So as we finish our review of risk management concepts and methods today, one of the things I wanted to share with you, over here on St. Croix on the Albert Sheen campus, a local business donated its expended technology. They had uh, boxes full of old PCs and old monitors. And I brought one of the monitors in and we were talking about it with one of the students. And they asked the question, are you gonna hack that monitor? And I said, no, but the PC they gave us, we're gonna hack. See, what happens is that people uh, get ready to get rid of something and they forget, oh, they want a backup copy of what's on that system, right? Because they want to move all their data and all their information where? From the old thing to the new thing? By the way, this also happens with photocopy machines because there's a copy of every single photocopy that was ever made on any photocopier in a hard disk on every photocopy machine everywhere. So if you take a photocopy machine apart, guess what you have? All the documents that were ever scanned, all the documents were ever copied, all of them on a disk. If they throw out their photocopiers, now there's a thing called dumpster divers. You might've heard the term where people go into the dump and they go into the dumpster and they pull stuff out. And it's like, oh, that old fax machine. It's like, oh, pay dirt, yeah. Oh, that old photocopy machine, cha-ching. Yeah, like photocopy machines, big. Old PCs and laptops, gold mine, absolute gold mine. People get their data out, off, and into the next new system. What they forget to do is to wipe that stuff on the old system. And that is a risk management thing that costs very little to address. But what happens when, not if, when somebody digs your old laptop out? and they pull it out. And did you know what happens to me every year? Since I've been here, I, I'm just full disclosure, okay? I love the students here. I was in WAPA. I was hamstrung in the front lobby of WAPA trying to get some stuff going and everybody was frustrated. Now we were commiserating and sharing. And I said, they said, how do you like it since you've been here in August of 2016? I said, I love the students. They're curious, they're thirsty. They wanna learn about this stuff. And what's not to like? I mean, I have the world's best topic to teach, right? I can't, I can't lose. This is just the greatest thing, you know. Uh, and I said, but, you know, it's a challenge to get people to see the simple things that put themselves at risk, right? And so one of the ladies there said, what, what's the biggest problem that you see people have with their stuff getting hacked? And I said, by far, they get a new device, they set up the first account, and off they go on the internet. It's the first account exposure. And she said, I don't know what you're talking about. And then I explained, I said, did you know when you click any message, any social media app, any web page, and you're using that first account you set up, the code behind that link executes with your root administrative elevated privileges and it saws right into the center of the kernel of that operating system and embeds itself and buries itself and it hides itself and there is no way you even know it's there in fact it's so good when you do this right here let me show you everybody see my screen let's share a screen it's time to share the screen everybody see this okay so here's the uh, task manager right and People want to know why everything's so slow and they go and they look on this screen. What they don't know is that the kernel level exploit that just embedded itself so deep in the core of the operating system, ring zero it's called, the most privileged corner of the operating system, it creates a fake screen just like this one. <laughs> Let me say that again. It creates a camouflage fake screen like this one. And there's another one behind there that's like, what? It's all bonkers and the lines are all up here and everything's red line. And you know, and you're like chugging along on a slow machine and you look, and when you see it's like, no, the CPU is only, shoot, it's not even breaking 30%. Shoot, the memory, I'm not even using half my memory. Oh, the disk is doing nothing, 0%, 1%. What the hell? And you look and the here's the drive light going bling, 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 bling. It's looked like a little Christmas tree light blinking. 
in real life, that's what the Christmas tree light is bringing, right? What's going on? Oh, bait and switch. You think the bad guys want you to know that you're on fire? No. What's the first thing I do? Cover their tracks. They come up with another little display here where they can take over. And that's pretty easy to do, right? Now, ghost on the machine. The second thing that happens is that when people get frustrated two or three years into a machine, it starts to get slow, it starts to get old, it starts to get clogged. Do they clean it out? Do they do a spring cleaning? No, they just go out and get another one, right? And here's the fun thing. If you're on a budget and you know cyber, you have cyber skills, you got game. So you say to yourself, I'm saving money. I, I'm not buying a new laptop. I'm going out on Saturday night and I'm gonna have a ball. I'm gonna use that money for something. I'm gonna live with my money. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna buy another $1,200 laptop. I'm gonna fix the one I bought just two years ago because there's no way, no how that thing is anywhere near close to the end of its shelf life. No way, no how. It should be able to run that baby till it drops for 10 years, should. So you wipe the slate clean. You use the techniques we can teach you in our classes in our cyber program. And what you do is you wipe the slate clean. You use a special process to clean slate to bare metal. So there's nothing on the bare metal. Yes. So the question, Suleiman, 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 Suleiman. I said Suleiman. Suleiman. Yeah, and we're recording too, so I'm kind of on the hook there. All right, so he asked, uh, do you have to put in a new license key? And the short answer is no. Actually, uh, there's a way that uh, Microsoft now knows the fingerprint, so to speak, of your hardware combination. And when it sees you connect to the internet again, it goes, oh, we know this guy, or we know this girl. And it automatically activates your key. That's the way things are working now in recent years. It wasn't always the case. Now, here's the thing that happens though. A lot of people will go ahead and reload Windows. And here's the fun part. They do part of the process. They delete the old hard drive, but then they keep on with the install program. And it reloads Windows on top of the old disk. <gasps> All the old software is in there again. All the old directories are in there again. I just deleted the hard drive when I reloaded Windows in the setup. I deleted it. Okay, here's a question. Did you back out after you deleted the hard drive? Did you say, okay, I'm done? Because I just removed the hard drive and its partition and I want it to be bare metal. And did you say, okay, now I'm going to stop the setup? Because I got nasties running in my memory, RAM, not on the hard drive. Resident random access memory. The active RAM of your computer is huge. There are creepy crawlies loaded in the back corner of that RAM. And if you don't cut off your machine, remove the battery and power it off for 60 seconds, that deleted disk you thought you deleted is never really deleted. Because some nasty's like, oh, strap on. It's going to get tight for a while, but as long as they don't pull the plug, we're good. And they don't, people are in a hurry. So they go ahead and reload Windows. And when they, oh, they get back into Windows, it's like, dang, there's the same old photos and the same, oh, I wanted to get rid of those movies. I didn't mean to keep those movies. Those are, I'm gonna get in trouble with these movies, right? They try to get rid of that stuff. And there it is again. Yeah. Yes, so Suleiman said you can pull components out while it's running and then plug them back in and the stuff is still in there. That, that is an accurate statement. And there are actually YouTube videos of a group of students at Princeton University where Albert Einstein used to teach. It's one of the Ivy League schools in Princeton, New Jersey. Yeah, so they, they actually do that. They pull the RAM DIMMs out of a laptop and they, they recovered the encryption key so that they can break the encryption on the hard disk. And they do it with a can of compressed air. It is hot. What they're doing is so sexy. It's like, oh my gosh, these people don't have a life. 
They don't have a life. They don't have a social life. For them to sit around and figure this stuff out, how do they have any time to do anything else? I'll share the link with you on YouTube. It is amazing, but go ahead and, and type in Princeton encryption key recovery from RAM compressed air and it'll bubble up to the surface and in 15 minutes they'll show you how to do it and it works now where am i going with this when you have remnants of the old stuff reappear in a system that's called the ghost and the machine you didn't really get rid of it it's still there and if what is in there is nasty that's really bad if what's in there is critical for you and someone else has their hands on it, that's double bad for you. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Okay, that's, that's the challenge here, is to realize when you do a thing to improve your security, reliability, resilience with a device, don't do it at all. Risk management rule number two. We said there was one thing we wanted you to know about risk management, and that was what? How to put in plain English what it would cost if something that was important was lost. Oh, that rhymes. I got to make a wrap out of that or something. I got to do something with it, okay? That, that, that is profound, right? So how do you put it in plain English? Okay, not if it happens, but when it happens, here's what it's going to cost. What does it cost you to be down for business a week? What is it? How much revenue do you lose? Well, here at the university, they'd say, well, that depends on which week. Is it the week of registration when everybody's enrolling and their financial aid is starting to roll in? Well, that's bad. That is bad. Okay. What about like in the middle of the semester and everybody's already locked in? Maybe not so bad. It depends, right? It all depends. The timing of a thing. The second thing I want you to understand about risk management is you're either all in or you're not. Don't do anything half. Ghost in the machine happens simply because somebody's too, oh, they're big and bad and they're going to wipe it to bad metal and they brag about it to everybody because, you know, they're the man. They're the big man on campus or they're the, or they're the, they're the up and coming female professional of the cyber universe now, right? And, and they, they can leap tall buildings with single bounds, right? So they're Superwoman or Wonder Woman or both. That's the problem. We get prideful when we take some corners, we cut some steps, we forget, okay, no, no, no. We don't take the time to let the update run when it presents in the system tray. Hello, hello. Oh, there's some security updates you should have. Let me tell you something. Do you think that any of these rich guys the world over are gonna send you a notice in your screen that says, hey, we have a security update you really should load because it's going to make your system more stable and more secure. Do you think they're going to tell you, please load this now, because if you don't, they're going to get your bank account, and then your identity will be stolen, and then all your stuff will go, and, and then you'll try to blame us, and then there'll be a big lawsuit, so please load it now. Do you think they'd ever tell you that? No, they'll never tell you that. This is like Men in Black. Does everybody remember Men in Black? Yeah. Men in Black, one of my favorite movies. They tell you, nobody really wants to know. The aliens are out there. If they did, they lose their right mind, right? There are cyber things that happen all the time. That's part of risk management. Now, risk management is practical and mutually beneficial, but only if you do it certain things full tilt. If you can't, don't. Do it right or don't. Just don't. That would be the second thing I'd tell you about risk management. You have to get people to buy in and then they're like, oh, no, really, we got to go there. Yeah, give them 15 extra minutes because you don't want the two and a half hours they just spent to rebuild this machine to be wasted because you want to check out for your lunch early. Okay? We're saving you $1,200 on another purchase of a needless laptop you don't really need because you're stupid when you go home and you surf porn with the company laptop in the privacy of your home, thinking you're private and you're not private. It's not private. True story, first intern. True story. 
True story. First intern I had here at this campus was an ECS scholar intern who brought in his iPad. And he said that he was going to do some things. And we were talking about assessing uh, network exposure. The focus was, oh my gosh, everybody's sitting on the public open internet. Half of us on this territory, when we connect to a network, we're not in a private internal non-routable network. We're sitting out on the open internet, which is amazing and scary. Don't think about that too much. Anyway, <laughs> he came in and he said, okay, I got this iPad and it's really slow. I was doing something last night and I just, I can't, I can't clear it. And he had just bought the iPad and I said, do you know how to close all the open apps? You double tap the home key and then you swipe up, you swipe, I got to turn, I got to turn on my, I, I got to, I got to turn on my video. So, so, so are you seeing this? Yeah. Are you seeing me? Yeah. Okay. So you swipe up, swipe up, swipe up, and that closes the app, closes the app, closes the app, right? So, so I said, you double tap the home key and, and, and I mean, he was a brand new iPad and he had never had one. And so he was just, he was, he was just, he was just doing it. Right. And I said, yeah, you do this. And so I'm, I'm showing him like this and he's watching. And as I'm swiping up, I'm like, oh, naughty picture. Oh, naughty. Whoa, whoa, look at the time. Right. So it, he, he kind of turned around and he's like, I got it from here. And I'm like, yeah, please do. And so he ended up, he ended up doing this and he ended up closing it. Well, that was an awkward moment. And I didn't waste any time saying, look, this is your personal technology and you agreed to do this. And I, you have my word as a professional, a cyber professional, that's, that's, I'll sign a non-disclosure agreement right now. Your name will never come up. I'll never mention the specific websites that you were, uh, I'm not even gonna say anything about it. And, and actually it was, it was actually a very, uh, it was actually a very tasteful thing to just make light of it and go here, uh, here you close the rest. And he's like, okay. And then he didn't say, in truth, he didn't say anything else. <laughs> But then we did the assessment. We found out that on port 5,000, it was active, it was open. Mm. And there was traffic from his screen that was outbound. So his screen interactions and everything on his screen was being fed out to someone who had been watching him the night mm. before. <laughs> I'm just saying. Okay, again, you're gonna do something, do it right or just don't, just don't, okay? And the thing is, a lot of times we don't understand. The DMZ router, you have power in the DMZ. There is a Raspberry Pi. I wanna advocate everyone consider this. Now I'm gonna add limited time only. I'm going to throw an extra solution out there. I'm going to put it in the final exams and other category out on Blackboard. Okay. So just to make life interesting, this is an open invitation to use and compare a living learning laboratory among all of us in this class to examine the exposures that are currently active on our internet service in, at home, on the campus, wherever. Okay. Now, I'm not talking about doing things that are considered to be aggressive or intrusive. I'm talking about doing very basic things to just kind of assess. There are others we've worked with. And over the years in ECS scholars, there have been some amazing discoveries. But there's a new technology, it's called a Raspberry Pi. We might have mentioned this. It's part of the Internet of Things. For $35, you can purchase the same horsepower and hardware of what you used to buy in a laptop just five years ago, $35. It's the size of a credit card. You hook it up to your TV. If you hook it up to your home network, it will filter the nasty redirections. So when you click and you browse and you do that streaming media for entertainment in your home, a lot of times those ads you click, that's called a redirection. There's a little thing that pops up and you want to investigate. When you investigate, it takes you somewhere else. That's a redirection, a user redirection. Newsflash, up to a third of user redirections in most home networks are not to good sites. 
take a Raspberry Pi and configure it in a certain way, it does the DNS, it knows the naughty, it knows the bad links and it kills them. It's called the pie hole. You load it on the Raspberry Pi. We have surplus Raspberry Pis. If you are interested, I will post this additional solution. You could do this in lieu of your final exam. Ooh, okay. So you could check out final exam week and just not take your final exam and we just trade in. It's like, okay, here's what I have. Here's what I collected from my Raspberry Pi, right? And if you meet the criteria of the solution, you will log the same amount of credit that you would for the final exam. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? So that's what we're gonna do. And why are we doing this? Because risk management needs to be practical. It needs to be real and it needs to be personal. It needs to be personal. And then you need to, at some point a week after the pie hole is operating in your house, you gather the folks around and you say, make some popcorn. Right. Is my video still working? Yeah. Make some popcorn. Right. Get the get the ice cream out. Yeah. Bring the fudge. Yeah. And and the and the whipped cream and stuff. Everybody, you know, smoke them if you got them. Drink your libations. We're gonna we're gonna have a great show. And they're like, is it a new movie? Is it that new movie with the Rock? Is it the new movie with uh, Beyonce? No. No. Here's the Raspberry Pi hole. And here's what it did on our home network over the last week. And they go, what? And you pull up the console and that Pi hole shows, dang, 23,000 redirections canceled that were malicious. And then everybody kind of looks at each other while they're eating that popcorn. And then they start thinking, they're like, mm, mm, mm. Now, the good part about the pie hole is that it doesn't tell you which device. I mean, not unless you like turn up all the dials and then you want to find out. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> At which point you'd start tap dancing and you say, now remember people can fake Mac addresses also. So it could be that somebody is posing with your Mac address. It's called, it's called uh, uh, I forget what it's called. But anyway, that's a thing. They steal your Mac address, right? It's called MAC address spoofing, by the way. Okay, now I'm going to get, yes, a question. No, I was muted just the last couple of seconds. Are we back, St. Thomas? Are we back? Somebody from St. Thomas? Yes, yes, you're back. Okay, good. Um, all right, the question was, oh, local ads. So the, a question was raised, does the pie hole block local ads? We, one of our ECS scholars determined this summer that uh, they it wasn't very effective with local ads. I suspect that had something to do with the backend DNS configuration for the pie hole itself. There are some simple adjustments that would probably resolve that issue. But that is an interesting pattern is that local ads would not be deflected. Now, if local ads are brokered through Google and Google does some screening, and they're considered secure safe, then they wouldn't be blocked by the pie hole anyway. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. So what we want to do with the time remaining is we do want to get through the rest of the key concepts for risk management. And then after we finish these slides today, I'm going to start posting your scores for the submissions. And then I'm going to put the assessment for the module two so you can log your first attempt to the module two assessment on information security management methods and risk management, okay? And so what you wanna do is between now and Friday, you wanna brush up from the study guide and the, any of the related materials and uh, this, all right. So these are threat and vulnerability and assessment, TVA. 
TVA used to be known as the Tennessee Valley Authority in the Great Depression. Um, it's not the same TVA that we see here. TVA here stands for Threat, Vulnerability, and Assessment. Now, I like to consider other words, just as we learned that SETA or CETA, see, SETA, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, that's SETI, right? People get hung up on acronyms. I want you to have this idea of exposure. A vulnerability is an exposure. So we could call this threat exposure and asset. The intent here of this worksheet is critical. This is one of those key things. It's like, okay, so I'm supposed to make it real for people. You know, what is it gonna cost if something goes boom? This is one of the ways you do it. You look at a threat for a given exposure and what asset does it involve? If the asset doesn't matter, do you care? Now, can you imagine that you spend too much money protecting things that really don't really matter? Oh yeah, that happens all the time. And that's where cyber people lose their credibility. This worksheet helps. What you're doing is indexing or cross-referencing. I want you to notice how this is arranged. You list your assets and you put it in each one of these boxes and then you say okay here's a threat against this asset here's a threat against asset one here's a, another threat against asset one and see how they're doing it it's like threat one exposure one asset one now there's a second vulnerability a second exposure maybe the same server has a different exposure the dns is vulnerable so it could be a same threat different exposure but it's the same asset. It's our domain controller. What do you lose if you lose your domain controllers? Everything. What can I tell you about the University of the Virgin Islands domain controllers? Where are they? I'm gonna plead the fifth, that one. <laughs> the thing is, the thing is, I started this course telling you that the University of the Virgin Islands does have formidable and multi-layered defense in depth, and they have it structured given the, uh, given the network that they inherited here over a 30 year period. I would reconfigure some things differently, but the point is, is that there are consistent threats for different assets for different and for different exposures. And what you, it's the magic combination. Look, when you combine three colors, you get black. If you don't have three colors, you don't have black. If you're working with electricity and you touch the black wire, where do you see the color black in religious ceremonies the most? Funerals, yes, death, funerals. Give the lady a cigar, thank you. Only don't smoke too many of those or you'll be wearing black. Yeah, the thing is, yes, okay? The three elements, the threat, when the threat aligns with the exposure, aligns with the asset, boom. It's like funeral black. It is sudden death. The reason for this worksheet, in plain terms, take the time to fill it out, right? Don't forget that. TVA worksheet, when you have an alignment of threat, vulnerability, or exposure, and a critical asset, those are the ones that should be colored what? Red. Those are the greatest priorities. That's where you put your greatest effort. Does that make sense? And that's where you go to the stakeholders. You say, look, I'm not blowing smoke here. Look at the threat that we're facing. Look at the exposure we have and look at the asset we stand to lose. Now, if you don't wanna buy this thing, that's fine. If you don't wanna meet this requirement for federal information security standards, you sign right here. I'll go home and I'll sleep tonight, but I ain't wearing prison orange for you fool. I won't. And that's how you make it real, right? And if it's simple where, now this doesn't look simple at a first glance. Don't throw this at people and then start using a lot of techno jargon, right? Risk assessment, risk analysis, right? The goal is to identify, and you have to be able to repeat the method. What are we saying? The next person that picks up this thing ought to have some kind of agreement with you about what there's, if they have a totally different worksheet, something's wrong. 
okay? So repeatable method, everybody has to understand how it works. Everybody has to be bought in. They're like, okay. Now, there are very many granular, very busy slides on the process and how to proceed best and so on and so forth. And there are all sorts of PhDs who have, who now have, uh, you know, dissertations uh, in peer reviewed journals about the best risk management methods. I love risk management because it helped me talk to admin and finance people. But if I were to ever uh, continue with uh, advanced studies, I would want a PhD in security methods on the technical and system side of things, because that's my forte, that's my wheelhouse. Anyway, you see all these, all right, threat exploits, right? So you have a threat source. That means there's something that's possible. Then you have an initiation, right? So there's an event that happens. Then there's the active exploit. And there's an exposure and it causes an adverse impact and all this kind of stuff. Everybody uses different lingo uh, depending on which organization you're in. It's important for everybody to be speaking the same language, which is why I like to keep it simple. I have a possible threat that could, if they wanted to, exploit this exposure. Here's the asset effect. Here's what, here's how it eats your lunch money. Keep it simple, right? That's how you make the headway. Likelihood. What is the likelihood rating? Is it happening this season? Is it going to happen in three to four years over the life of a device or a system? I will tell you this, most hard drives are absolutely predestined to fail between four and five years. If you are using a laptop that's been around for four or five years, you best get to Office Max, buy a new hard drive and get your junk on a new hard drive because you will lose it. That's the likelihood. In four to five years, it is nearly 100% likely to just go and it just doesn't work. And that happens a lot more than we'd care to believe. Now. Why on a laptop? A laptop is knocked around. Now, if you have a solid state drive, that's a game changer. If you have an older laptop with spinning disks, that's a delicate little thing that's going to go boom if it drops or it gets jarred too much. A lot sooner than four or five years. The risk likelihood, rank. So am I going to expect you to know this for your assessment? I'll expect you to know that there are different levels of risk, right? Zero, not applicable. Five, almost certain, 100% likely in the next 12 months. Now, what do we know about hurricanes, really bad hurricanes? Oh, I don't know. Every 15 to 20 years on average, we get a really bad one. And if we don't get one for a while, like 25 years, we get them twice, which is what happened with Irma and Maria. We got a double dose in a short order, right? So law of averages aside, this is real stuff, right? 75%, 50%, moderate is 50% likely in the next 12 months. Where does the 12 month period come from? The 12 month period, so that's a great question. So Lyman, you're, you have lots of questions, but I like them. <laughs> so those are good questions because when you're talking about risk management, you're talking about aligning your asset protection with the available budget. And nine times out of 10 in organizations, that happens on an annual fiscal cycle. Uh, so I'm glad you asked why the 12 month. In order for administrative and finance people to know, they have a, an annual view. It's like, okay, we're tracking good for this year. If we can just finish out this year, what? Then they get to report good things to the people who pay them big bucks. That's why it's 12 months. Oh, hey, you can't report this. Yeah. Lost it. Point of fact, and I'm glad you raised this, Suleiman. In fact, I want you to send me an email that says 12 hour short fuse, because I'll post additional credit for your question. If you're looking at risk likelihood in the technical arena on network forensics, there is such a thing as likely within the next 12 hours, the next 120 minutes the next 12 minutes, the next 12 seconds, the next 12 one hundredths of a second. They're the same multiples, right? But 
on a technical level, you can have almost certain 100% and it happens in the blink of an eye. I kid you not, we put the right thing out there last season in spring in system security and our students got on the screen and one of them gasped. I'm really sorry I didn't have the recording going at that point because I thought, oh, that would be so cool to have that on a YouTube video. They're like, <gasps> 932 attempts to hack within a 24-hour period. And it started when? Within five minutes of turning the machine on. 100%. You want attention? So here's where we get to the personal safety portion of our class. There are certain BitTorrent clients, and I'm not gonna mention the name precisely, but it's red and it starts with the letter W and it's really popular and cute and it runs in your system tray. And it's always sending and receiving files in the background because that's what BitTorrent clients do. They help you download stuff that you might not that you are supposed to download and some things you are not supposed to download and BitTorrent clients like micro torrent are great and i use them but then i uninstall them when i'm not using them as in delete them from my system because if they're act if they're if they're loaded on the system they're lurking in the background and every time i reboot that thing it's sending and receiving stuff i guarantee you within a matter of seconds somebody's going to be on your system and it's going to be like that first summer with the first intern here, where it's like, what? And I'm just asking you, how lucky are you, right? I love those Clint Eastwood movies. Are you feeling lucky, punk? No, uh, all right. Assessing potential impact on an asset value. If you don't have personal banking on your device, that's a plus. But most of us do something. We order stuff online. We have credit cards connected to our junk, right? What's the impact on some of our assets? Those are things that you should assess along with the risk. So what are we saying? Level of risk, different levels. Level of importance of the asset, different levels. Level of exposure, different levels. Where do you get the red? When it's high exposure, high threat, high asset value. It's the trifecta. It's the hat trick. It's the holy trinity of OMG, what are you doing running this on your system? Stop now, right? That's what risk impact is. That's where you have to assess these things. And assessing risk impact helps you understand the level of risk priority. Aggregation and uncertainty. Now, now, okay, so there's all sorts of, we could spend an entire course talking about risk management. In fact, when you get into advanced programs, advanced studies, you often have to take like intermediate, you know, beginning, intermediate and advanced risk management, right? And it gets really in the weeds here. This is the thing I want you to understand. You can have a really bad risk management scenario simply because you have moderate risk here, moderate risk there. Oh, but it's on the same system. They tend to have a multiplying effect with each other. They don't just add the risk like, oh, I'm half as likely to blow my screen up because I'm using some bootleg streaming media thing. <laughs> oh, but I'm lucky and I'm careful. Oh, but I'm also running a network gaming protocol that everybody knows has been hacked six times. Mm -hmm. And that's also like half. Does that mean that between the two, you have a 100% chance of getting hacked? No, it means more like you have half times a half. It's more like 250%. They multiply against each other. Sometimes the effects in proximity, it's called aggregation and uncertainty, right? So risks can kind of like clump up together. I don't know if that makes, is that a good way to explain it? Clump, clumping, clumping up together, right? All right, so risk determination, yeah. Clearwater, all right, so Clearwater is a company that uh, does cybersecurity, IRM, right? Risk rating matrix, they all have cute, look at this, impact and likelihood, they have a matrix. This is the area where you wanna spend your time and your money. These graphic organizers are great. I suggest in your efforts to help finance and admin people understand why they gotta spend their money, you use this kind of 
I mean, if you said this one thing, we got to buy this one thing, why? Because it's right here with the purple. Now, if you don't want to buy it, just sign off right here and say, I'm wearing the prison orange when this goes boom next week or next day or before the end of the day. I'm cool with that. I mean, you hired me to tell you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. The truth will set you free. And if you don't understand that concept right now, you need to go back to Sunday school and spend some time in prayer. Just say it. Okay. Risk rating worksheet. So these things are good. Some of these tools are good to help you prepare and plan your presentation to your stakeholders. At the end of the day, none of this matters. If you can't put it in front of them where it makes sense, right? This is great for us to do. Does anyone know here what customers order via SSL inbound secure socket layers? You know what secure socket layers is, right? It's a little padlock in the upper left corner of a website, secure socket layer. Yeah. yeah. Did you know it was like retired two years ago because it was hacked? Uh huh. SSL has been hacked. Now we use TLS. TLS replaced SSL. Which makes me wonder what's going on with this uh, textbook author. I might send uh, like a suggestion for uh, updated content next year. I'm just saying. Risk evaluation, right? If you're using SSL, mm, I would suggest you get on TLS. Documenting the results of risk assessment. Okay, so risk treatment, risk response. We talked about risk treatments. Are there cost-effective treatments that will reduce the risk and help improve? Those go hand in glove with, and here, oh no, this is the last thing. Last thing, and then we're done. Everybody look. Mitigation, transference, acceptance, and termination. These are the four responses every organization can decide on, and your job is to make sure. Okay, I have a threat. I have an exposure, I have an asset. What's our response? Is it mitigation? Is it transference? That means I buy an insurance policy. Transference means I'm gonna transfer the risk to a company and they're gonna pay for it if it goes boom. Acceptance, we're not doing anything. It's not likely to happen. I'm not spending money that we otherwise need for other things. Termination, we're discarding this thing we're getting rid of it we're removing the risk because we find this unacceptable we're not going to run this system anymore because we're sitting ducks mitigation means i figure out how to reduce the exposure so my asset is less exposed to a threat that's what mitigation is those are the four four risk treatments in a nutshell those are the four categories of risk treatments now how you actually do that with devices and systems is kind of the you know the nitty-gritty in the operational environment I, yes. Now, you have four slides that explain each. Please spend your time. The slides are in there. Good luck on your first attempt at a module two assessment. Thank you, sir. My favorite is not risk acceptance. I'm just telling you right here. I just, I don't, I don't like risk assess acceptance. I think that's a cop out. It's like, Oh, there are always risks online. You know, we're always going to have people trying to hack us. I'm like, mm. okay. So you just want to accept it, huh? Okay. Well, if you're feeling lucky, punk, as Clint Eastwood would say. And with that, we're going to stop our sharing and our recording. Uh, thank you for joining us today. That concludes our review of essentials for risk management.